Welcome to our third training module, Child and Family Safety in Family Preservation Services. This training is going to focus on the FPS therapist's responsibility in ensuring the safety of families, especially the children with whom we work. Before reviewing this material, it will be most helpful if the therapist has also viewed the Children's Administration video, Making a CPS Referral, a guide for mandated reporters. Before beginning this training, make sure you have the following things handy. Your copy of the appropriate RCW, copies of the handout, Legal Definitions of Child Abuse and Neglect, and any note-taking implements you might desire. As we begin to explore issues related to family and child safety in FPS, we'll be taking a look into four major areas, mandated reporting, differences between safety and risk, safety planning, and the FPS therapist's role in enhancing family and child safety. Given that families aren't referred to FPS unless there is an identified substantial risk that a child may need to be removed from his or her, her home, or that they've already been in out-of-home placement and reunification is soon to occur. It should be clear that the safety of children in returning to their homes is of primary importance to our work in family preservation. Providers of FPS need to understand, support, and be prepared to act upon the legal and philosophical framework underlying these services. Accordingly, we'll begin by examining the role of the FPS provider as a mandated reporter of suspected child abuse and neglect. So first of all, what is mandated reporting? It refers to the statutory requirement to report suspicions of child abuse or neglect to the designated agency, Children's Administration. Of course, reports also can ma be made directly to law enforcement if necessary. What is meant by child abuse or neglect? From the RCW, and I quote, the injury, sexual abuse, sexual exploitation, negligent treatment or maltreatment of a child by any person under circumstances which indicate that the child's health, welfare, and safety is harmed. So let's talk a little bit about legal definitions of child abuse and neglect. You should have a handout available which includes definitions and examples to help you clarify both the broader and the finer definitions of child abuse and neglect. This can also assist you in determining whether any safety concerns you might have fall under the heading of, of child abuse and neglect and thus must be reported to CPS. Here's a suggestion to you. While the handout does provide statutes, definitions, and examples, this brief training couldn't begin to encompass such vital topics as identifying signs or symptoms of abuse or appropriate interventions. A concise yet thorough and extremely useful resource may be found at the Children's Administration website. Here's their address. There are also many clinically sound trainings, seminars, journals, and so on available on the topic of identification of and intervention in child abuse and neglect. Keeping in mind the parameters of your role as an FPS therapist, access these resources to increase your knowledge and skill level. So getting back to mandated reporting, who is a mandated reporter? There are three subsections of this RCW that detail who is required by law to report suspected child maltreatment. Summarizing them, because they do go on in quite a bit of detail, first of all, medical providers and other helping professionals, Department of Corrections employees who both ob either observe offenders or observe children with whom offenders come in contact, and any adult who has reasonable cause to believe that a child who resides with them has suffered severe abuse. Please refer to the RCW for a comprehensive list of mandated reporters. FPS providers 
frequently fall under a number of these uh, covered categories. However, the category of social service counselor, counselor generally covers most FPS providers. Must a mandated reporter have proof of child abuse or neglect before making a CPS referral? That's an easy one, no. The RCW specifies that one only need have reasonable cause to believe that child abuse or neglect has occurred. If you have any reason to suspect a child has been maltreated, CPS should be contacted and a referral made. How quickly must they be contacted? Well, the RCW actually specifies that the report must be made at the first opportunity, but in no case longer than 48 hours after becoming aware of the situation. However, since everyone watching this is involved in family preservation services, please be aware that if the referral is related to an FPS-involved family, you need to make the report immediately and follow up with written notification within 24 hours. Let me also add that you'll be contacting both the referring social worker and CPS intake. So what constitutes making a referral to CPS? Well, it begins with an intake call when the referent, whoever that may be, contacts the designated CPS intake worker who then gathers as much information as possible. Be sure to have all available information in front of you and be prepared to answer detailed questions from the intake worker. Don't worry if you don't have a lot of information. Your job isn't to go out there and investigate or make sure you have the proper information. Just come armed with as much information as you have because the intake worker is going to be asking you a large number of questions. Also, check with your agency to see if there is any specific protocol around CPS reporting that might be in place. Some of the examples of this might be that you might be required to contact your immediate supervisor before making a CPS referral, or you may be expected to complete certain intra-agency types of forms, like a, um, a critical incident report or some other type of specialized documentation. So check within your agency to find out what their procedures are. A lot of people ask, well, can a CPS referral be made anonymously? I don't want them to know that it was me. Well, yeah, it can be made anonymously, but don't do it. As a mandated reporter, the way to prove that you've fulfilled your obligation to report is by giving your name, phone number, and your connection to the child involved to the intake worker when making the referral. It's helpful to find out the name of the intake worker to whom you've made the report. Make note of this in your FPS charting notes as further verification you've fulfilled your responsibility as a mandated reporter. Also, in case questions should arise later. Can non-mandated individuals make reports to CPS? Absolutely. And if somebody shares information with you about their own suspicion of a child being maltreated, please encourage them to report it directly to CPS themselves. Please keep in mind, however, this doesn't take away your responsibility as a mandated reporter. You still have to make a report unless you make the call with them and provide your own identifying information to the intake worker. Now, we mentioned in the deliverables training that it's required that all FPS providers do go through the mandated reporting training. And according to the contract, all new FPS staff are required to view the video, Making a CPS Referral, a Guide for Mandated Reporters, within two weeks of being hired to provide these services. And I mean, you may be hired by your agency, but not hired to do FPS. However, under any of the um, Children's Administration service contracts, that is a requirement. You can get a copy of that video directly from Children's Administration, or you can access that online 
and we've included the, uh, the website here. After viewing the video, each employee or subcontractor must sign and date a data statement acknowledging his or her duty to report child abuse and neglect. The video must be viewed and the appropriate statement signed at least once every three years according to the contract. Some agencies have tighter restrictions than that. One agency I'm aware of requires its employees to view the video and sign a new CPS statement every six months. So be sure and find out what your agency's requirements are. Some final words on mandated reporting. You know, <clears throat> making a CPS referral should never be viewed as a negative action. Remember, the purpose for mandated reporting and for CPS in general is to ensure the safety and well-being of all children. And not coincidentally, that's exactly the focus of Family Preservation Services. As FPS therapists and parapros, we pledge to ensure the safety of the child as being our top priority. As mandated reporters, we're given the legal responsibility not for investigating allegations or considering pot potential repercussions of a CPS referral, but for speaking up any time we have reason to suspect that a child may be experiencing abuse or neglect. Failure to fulfill this obligation as a mandated reporter may not only jeopardize a child's safety, it could result in the loss of your FPS contract, your job, suspension or revocation of your professional licensure and or registration, and your inability to obtain future employment in the field of social welfare. So please, understand and be prepared to fulfill this vital responsibility to the children of your community, as well as to your profession, your agency, and to yourself. Let's look now at the differences between safety and risk. So what are we really talking about here? A lot of people think of safety and risk as being essentially the same side or the same, uh, the same thing, but there are decided differences between them. So let's take a little time to define them. Safety refers to freedom from danger or injury. The primary focus of FPS is ensuring that children are free from threats to their health or well-being. So then what does risk mean? Well, risk is like the other side of that coin. Risk refers to danger or the possibility of suffering harm or loss. Risks are those factors that jeopardize a child's ability to live in a safe environment. They're essentially different sides of the same coin, as I indicated. Both are important elements of our work in FPS. Safety is what we seek to promote or enhance or increase. Risk is what the FPS intervention seeks to manage or reduce or hopefully to eliminate. There's another significant distinction to keep in mind when we consider safety and risk. Safety focuses on current conditions that may harm or endanger a child now. It involves immediate action to protect children from current threats. Risk, on the other hand, focuses on factors that estimate the likelihood of future child, or abu child abuse or neglect. It involves planned interventions to decrease the risk of harm. So you can see that safety is more in the, in the here and now. Risk is more looking into the future about what we think could happen based on factors that exist. It's critical to identify both risk factors and safety concerns as quickly as possible. First of all, to ensure that there's a plan to keep children safe despite current safety concerns, and also to develop planned interventions that decrease, or hopefully will decrease, the risk of potential safety concerns, some of which maybe haven't even emerged yet, but can be predicted based on the identified risk factors. How are these things identified? How do we identify risk factors and safety concerns? 
Well, you know, by the time FPS gets the referral, that's already started. Beginning with the referring social worker's very first meeting with a family and continuing once that family is referred to FPS, a variety of different areas such as parenting skills, history of child abuse and neglect within, uh, uh, for either of the parents are considered and addressed through observation, interviews, and the application of assessment tools. Risk factors within and around the family, including environmental factors, are gauged and assessed in terms of what part they might play in a family's ability to keep their children safe. And safety concerns are identified. In other words, what components of a child's safety might be jeopardized by the identified risk factors? And then a search is undertaken for ameliorative measures, things that are going to lessen the threat that may intervene in or even prevent circumstances that could result in harm to a child. These steps set the stage for risk assessment and for safety planning. Before a case is referred to FPS, the referring social worker will typically have assessed risk factors and developed at least a rudimentary safety plan for the family. The FPS therapist also assesses various levels of risk, more formally with the NICFAS or NICFAS-R at the beginning and end of services and less formally at all stages throughout the intervention. Levels of both risk and safety will fluctuate during the course of an intervention, so ongoing assessment of both is necessary. By the FPS therapist, the Children's Administration social worker, and by any other treaters who might be involved with an FPS referred family. That's a lot of information. Before we go on, let me ask, are there any questions about what's risk, what's safety, what the differences might be? OK, let's take a look then at safety planning. We've already talked about the referring social workers' involvement in doing a safety plan. And if one has been completed before a case comes to FPS, then the social worker will be attaching a copy of their safety plan to the referral, will be reviewing it with the family at their first face-to-face -face meeting, and then will continue to review that at least every two weeks throughout the intervention. But safety plans are a bit more than that. So let's talk about, first of all, how families feel about them and what we can do to make them more effective. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> As we talked about, you have the, in your hand a copy of that safety plan. When you get the referral, we review it, and we ongoingly review it every two weeks. But when you go in to meet with a family, and you're getting to know them the first time, you're getting information, you're asking them questions, you're paying attention to what's going on in the home, and then comes the point where you need to ask them, um, do you have your copy of the safety plan that the social worker left with you? And you may find that you're met with a blank stare. So despite the fact that a family may have signed and agreed to a safety plan when the referring social worker was in their home, they may not even know what it is. They may not know how to comply with it. In fact, all they may remember is that they signed something that allowed them to keep their children in their home. So in most cases, you know, that's not the fault of the social worker. It's more typically related to the stress of being investigated by CPS. You know, also, there is a little statement at the bottom of the safety plan that basically says, if you don't do this, your children might be removed. So faced with that, most parents are going to sign basically anything that's put before them. They don't really even care that much about what's in the document. So even when a safety plan developed by a CA social worker is nicely done, 
It provides a good list of safety concerns. It provides action steps to correct these problems. And it even specifies who's responsible for what, how it will be done, and so on. The family might not find this plan as helpful as it was actually designed to be. So one of the things you'll find, and this is not an uncommon thing, is the safety plan that's completed by the investigating social worker will quite clearly identify what the family shouldn't do. So for example, it might say, Sam will not hit the children. Susan will not leave the children unsupervised. Jen will make sure the children get three meals a day. It will, well, that was more of a positive thing. Okay, Jen will not forget to feed the kids. They often don't say or don't give ideas as to what family members could do instead. So when whatever the situation that led to the referral happened, if that situation comes up again, then what should the family do instead? That information is often missing from safety plans. But safety plans really are valuable tools. So as an FPS provider, part of our responsibility is to ensure that our clients follow them. They have signed them. They've agreed to them. It is expected that they follow them. What we can do to be helpful to enhance client compliance um, is to supplement it with another plan, another plan that's creative collaboratively between you as the FPS therapist and the family. So let's take a look at what makes a safety plan useful. A good safety plan clearly states, first of all, the safety concerns. Think of safety concerns as what we hope to avoid, what presents risks to the child. Then, a good safety plan also lists available resources. In other words, who could be contacted if a threat to that child's safety should appear? If this undesirable situation looks like it's going to happen, what could the family do to prevent it or to step in and change things? And last of all, an action plan. What specific steps should be taken and who should take them to ensure that the children are safe? It sounds simple, right? Well, it should be. <laughs> because developing a safety plan really is a pretty simple, straightforward process. But you know what? There is one thing about helping professionals in general that tends to make developing safety plans challenging. And you might be able to guess what that is. We always want to jump in and fix things. So whether it's the FPS therapist or the Children's Administration social worker, we always want to try to create safety plans that are more future-oriented than present-oriented. And I mean, you know, think to every training you've ever gone to, think back to college or whatever, hasn't everybody always told you, don't be reactive, be proactive? Well, <laughs> when we create safety plans, it really is one time you need to be thinking more in terms of reaction rather than prevention. When you develop a safety plan, don't include resources that the family might be able to access next month or the skills that you're hoping that you're going to be able to teach them next week. Instead, you need to think about, what if a crisis happened 20 minutes after you leave their house? Or what if, what if something happens in the middle of the night? Or what if something happens on Christmas Eve? Then what are they going to do? You know, a lot of times we think in terms of, well, I'll help you get connected with an AA sponsor, and then if you think you feel like drinking, you can call that sponsor. That's all well and good, but what if she feels like drinking tonight? Then what's she going to do? That sponsor isn't in place yet.
A safety plan needs to focus on exactly this. If the thing you're hoping to avoid looks like it's going to happen, then this is what the family should do. And that's what I spell out here. If the situation you wish to avoid, in other words, whatever it is that could threaten your child's safety, uh, could cause problems in your ability to maintain your child in your home, if that starts to happen, this is what you can do to lessen the possibility that any harm will come to the child. And you'll be using whatever resources you have on, on hand at that time. Here's another way to look at it. <clears throat> Safety plan. In case of crisis, do this. Short and sweet. <clears throat> it needs to be concise and to the point because, I mean, think about it. How clearly do you think in, in times of emergency or crisis? People tend to get frazzled no matter how well organized they typically are when a crisis occurs. So when you're helping a family develop a safety plan, limit the number of steps in that action plan and limit the number of words you use to explain it. A training I went to once said, when you're dealing with people in crisis, make statements of no more than five words per, and no more than five letters per word. Keep it simple. And that's what's going to make a difference. So, for example, if dad passes out, Tim will call 911. If parents are fighting, Lakeisha will go to Pat's house. If John gets violent, Kelly will take the kids next door. If mom is drinking, Terry will call dad for a ride. Short and sweet. If this thing starts to happen, this is what you will do. Now, you don't tell the family this is what they will do. You work through those issues with the family and say, if this happens, what kind of option could you use? Who could you turn to? Who could you call? Where could you go? And take the family's suggestions and ideas and put that down in the form of a safety plan for them. So all these great resources, all the skills that you have or that you want to share, everything that you want to wish to introduce the family to, they don't belong in the safety plan. But save them because those are the things that you're probably going to want to put in the family service plan. The service plan calls for proactive planning, resource developing, skill building, practice, modeling, all those things you do so well as an FPS therapist. That's what, go in the, what goes in the service plan. The safety plan is if the bad thing happens, this is what you ought to consider doing. So here's how to create an effective safety plan. First of all, you're going to want to review, if the social worker did a safety plan, review that and um, because you should have a copy and the client should have a copy. And, you know, it goes without saying, if one wasn't done, then you're going to omit this step. But looking at the safety plan, if one was done, ask these questions. Does this safety plan include each safety concern that was designated on the FPS referral form? In other words, Everything that the social worker tells you is a reason why this family is being referred for services. Has that safety concern been included on the safety plan? Because they should be there. Next, does it provide specific action steps or does it merely tell the family what not to do? Most of the families that we've worked with have actually been told on more than one occasion don't do this, don't do that. But what is often missing is alternative suggestions. Next question to ask is, does the family actually agree with the information that's on the CA safety plan? You know, this is a great opportunity for you to get the family's take on what led to the referral. Now, I want to point out um, that while they may not agree with what the social worker said, 
um, your role isn't necessarily to get in the middle of any kind of argument or, or disagreement, but just merely to hear them out. It might be the first opportunity for them to really air their sense of what's happened. And maybe they have legitimate concerns or grievances. So being able to hear them, hear them out, is a, a great way to join with them during that first meeting and in subsequent meetings. Next is, does the, is that safety plan really a safety plan, or is it more of a service plan? So look for, does it provide strategies for, for intervention should something happen? or prevention if they see a situation blowing up? Or does it just focus on developing future resources? Quite frequently, safety plans that I've seen from referring social workers have, done, have said things like, mom will check in with so-and-so three times a week, or Ted will go for a drug and alcohol evaluation by such and such date. That's a service plan and not a safety plan. So if either you as the therapist or the client don't feel that the safety plan provides them with clear and sufficient direction about what they should do if one of these situations arises that jeopardizes their child's safety, then the development of a new or a supplemental plan with them really can make a huge difference in their willingness or ability to follow the CA safety plan. Once you've reached, or once the family has reached a decision to develop a safety plan, the next step really is to just pick up where the other safety plan left off. So do make sure, as I mentioned earlier, that every safety concern is included. And if either the family or you as the therapist want to add additional ones, this is the time to do it. You know, a lot of times if you ask the family, I know what the social worker sees as the biggest safety concerns, but what do you see as safety concerns? They will be able to point out other things. Well, I'm afraid if I don't lock Cynthia in her room and she gets out and goes out in the middle of the night, something terrible could happen to her. So here we have a real legitimate concern. The social worker's concern is that they're locking their daughter in the room. But the parent's concern is that if the child continues to sneak out in the middle of the night, something serious could happen to her. So this is another really valid thing to address in that safety plan, not ignoring the other issue, but adding to it. As I mentioned earlier, do be prepared for family members to disagree with the social worker's assessment or interpretation of what's gone on. But I want to encourage you. <laughs> you know, sometimes a social worker will say, you know what, if we want to do good cop, bad cop, and you want me to be the bad cop, that's fine. As long as we can keep these children safe, I'll be the bad guy if that's what's going to work. That's kind of, uh, kind of a sticky trap to fall into. It can be used, but that it, it, there's a decided downside. But what I do want to point out is, while we are always working side by side with a referring social worker, at this first meeting, when you're talking about safety concerns and so on, it's not the time to stand up and say, you guys are wrong, the social worker is right, and you need to see it their way because that first meeting is when engagement is the real focus. These services are voluntary. Of course, there could be repercussions if the family says, well, I'm not going to do this, then th th it certainly could happen that their child is removed or a judge has some different view of what's going to happen next, that type of thing. But picking a fight with the family over whether they're right or the social worker's right is not a good thing to do when you're first trying to connect with them. So working with the family, you will want to create a list of these safety issues and the ways to address them. And here's where your skill as a clinician comes in. 
because you need to include the social workers' concerns, yet they need to fit in with the family's perspective. Sometimes that can be a challenge. Help family members brainstorm about what available supports are there for them. These could be friends, neighbors, extended family, community crisis services, um, all kinds of different things. A church is frequently a good source of support. So look for those available supports and then help determine specific action steps that could be taken to ensure that the children will be safe. Here's the odd thing. Even if the safety plan that you help the family create says exactly the same things as the referring social worker safety plan, you can imagine what I'm going to say next. Families will typically prefer the one that they feel they wrote, that they have ownership in. Not only that, they're going to prefer the one that doesn't have an authority figure telling them, you do this or we take your kids because that's how they will typically interpret the CA safety plan. So here's an important note that even though I'm going on about how wonderful your safety plan might be, even though you and your client may prefer the safety plan that together you write, that doesn't mean you can ignore the social worker's safety plan. It still continues to play an important role in the FPS intervention. Again, you've heard this so many times, but it is really important, and it's something that's easy to overlook if the safety plan isn't an active part of your intervention with the family. You still are required to review the CA safety plan with the family at least every two weeks. Now, as long as that second or supplemental safety plan contains all the pertinent requirements that were detailed in the CA plan, you really only will need to review the second plan. Assuming that you document the results and you report it to the social worker, um, to remain in compliance with this contractual expectation. If, though, that therapist-generated safety plan doesn't include every item in the CA safety plan, you're still going to need to review the CA safety plan separately. What I would recommend is that you simply just discuss this whole issue with the social worker and make sure that they're okay and comfortable with the second safety plan. Make sure that it includes all those elements so that you don't have to say, okay, this is our safety plan, this is the social worker safety plan, because that's not the way it's meant to be. It's not about who writes the best plan or who the family likes best or whatever. Anyway, it does go without saying that the referring social worker should certainly receive a copy of any additional or supplemental safety plan and that they should approve that. The same goes for any kind of document that you should generate in the course of Family Preservation Services. A few last words, just to kind of reiterate some things. You know, families quite frequently find safety plans to be one of the most helpful things we do because it's concrete, it's solid, it's something that they can, you know, tack up on their refrigerator or next to their bathroom mirror or something like that. And so in times of crisis, it's there, it's real, it gives them a solid direction. Keeping these safety plans sh short and sweet is what makes them most useful in times of crisis. And then you can suggest that they keep it someplace accessible. Now, you know, not everybody wants to have a safety plan posted on their refrigerator where everybody who comes in their house can see it. But suggest to them, keep this someplace where you know where it is, maybe inside the front cover of the phone book or something like that. So in case a crisis does occur, you know where to turn. So again, remember that the intent of this safety plan is not to see who can write the best plan, whose is most comprehensive, whose the family likes better, whatever. It's to ensure that in whatever way 
the family is able to comply with the safety plan by having a clear idea of what they can do in case of crisis, which means that they can, there's a better possibility of them keeping their children safe. And if their children remain safe, then they will no longer need to be involved with CPS. And that's the goal of this, keeping children safe. Which leads us to the final segment of this training module, which is, okay, as an FPS therapist, how can you help to enhance family and child safety? So let's look at some ways that you as the therapist can, in, can help to ensure that children in their home are safe. We've talked about some of the most important means of enhancing safety, such as compliance with mandatory reporting, ongoing assessment of risk levels and safety concerns, and the development and, and implementation of safety plans. But, you know, really a focus on safety, on family and, and specifically child safety, is absolutely inherent in every aspect of family preservation whether or not you're consciously aware of it. It's, it's what we do. During the course of every FPS intervention, you're going to remain vigilant at all times. You're going to be observing the behavior of family members towards each other. You're going to be listening to what's said and what's not said. You're going to be assessing environmental factors. You're going to be looking at their neighborhood, community, their home, their yard, the sounds, everything about what's going on in this family's life. And you're going to be always open to any kinds of suggestions or signs or symptoms that child safety is being compromised in any way. Now, the NICFAS or NICFAS-R helps to pinpoint when you um, do the family assessment specific areas where safety concerns might exist. And the written family assessment highlights and explains those concerns. And then the service plan develops various ways of managing, correcting, or eliminating these concerns. Throughout the intervention, you are also helping the family build on existing strengths. And the way that you're doing this after helping them to identify these strengths is to teach pertinent new skills including techniques that might decrease potential harm to children and that will increase child safety. You may be teaching them other non-safety related skills, but your safety related skills are the primary focus of the FPS intervention. You're also going to be connecting families to available resources in the community. And you're going to be helping them strengthen, strengthen existing connections with extended family, with neighbors, with other people that they may suggest to you or that you learn about or suggest. All of these elements that I've just been talking about work together to one primary purpose, to ensure that children can safely remain in their own homes and in the care of their own families without the need of intervention from outside sources. That's what family preservation is all about. Something that people frequently ask me, therapists often ask is, well, what should you do if you no longer believe that a child is safe in their home? What if you're at a family's home and something occurs or someone tells you something or you sense something that says to you, this is no longer a safe place for this child to be. Well, of course, not only as an FPS therapist, but as a mandated reporter, you need to contact CPS intake immediately if you become aware of a situation where you believe the child's safety is imminently threatened. And again, as we've already covered, the referring social worker also needs to be contacted immediately with written notification following within 24 hours. If you believe the child is in immediate danger, the first call should be to the police. 
don't take the time. I mean, we're talking immediate danger. Then don't take the time to call CPS first or to call the, the referring social worker. Call 911 first. If you can do it right then and there, then do it. If you need to get out of the situation yourself to safely make that call, do that. You will need to use your own best judgment. So if you feel a child must be removed from a dangerous situation immediately, call the police as soon as it's safe to do so. Do what you can to de-escalate the situation if that's an option. Relocate family members to a safer location if appropriate and possible. Now, I'm not talking about popping them in their car and taking off, but if you need to go to another part of the house or outside the home or something like that, it, of course, depends on what the threat is. But if that is a possibility and it's appropriate, then do so. And, of course, provide support and reassurance as much as you possibly can if that's appropriate. You'll need to utilize all of your clinical skills. And especially if you have any specialized, uh, received any specialized training in things like crisis intervention, mediation, de-escalation techniques, and so on, do what you can to keep the situation safe while you wait for authorities to arrive. But don't attempt to remove a child from their parents. And never feel that you need to place yourself in unnecessary danger to protect a child. And this can be a really difficult situation. But there's two things that I want you always to keep in mind. First of all, FPS therapists do not have the legal authority to take a child from his or her parental custody, period. You do not have that authorization. Secondly, the decision whether or not a child should be removed from the home is not ever up to the FPS therapist. Okay, so don't feel like this is something that you need to do because you will not be supported in that decision. Also, another thing to remember is that none of you would ever be expected to place yourself in harm's way to keep a child safe or a child or any family member. So your safety is not less important than a safe, the safety of a child. But there are other um, designated authorities to step in and take that action. If you believe it's necessary, you can recommend it, but you can't do it yourself. And the decision is not up to you. But your safety is important, too, and you should never, ever forget that. There's lots of excellent trainings out there, books, workshops, journals, um, seminars, all kinds of things that address the topic of therapist safety. So in addition to honing your own clinical skills, you truly should take advantage of, and I highly um, suggest, recommend, that you take advantage of any available opportunities to increase your own preparation for dealing with potentially volatile or otherwise dangerous situations. It's always helpful to be prepared for any kinds of situations that you might encounter. But I also want to assure you, and I know that those of you who are already providing FPS know this already, by and large, even families who are initially resistant, maybe even blatantly hostile and belligerent, typically, fairly quickly, come to find family preservation an incredibly helpful and beneficial service. And our clients can actually become quite protective of us um, in terms of suggesting it may not be safe for you to come to this neighborhood after dark, or, you know, can we, can we meet someplace else, or um, I've had people run interference for me on the way out to my car because they thought that perhaps I might not be safe in their neighborhood. So people typically find FPS to be a really positive, beneficial service. So any type of aggressive behavior targeting FPS therapists really is, is pretty rare. However, it's not uncommon for us to be identified with CPS, and by and large, people aren't fond of CPS workers, which is unfortunate because CPS workers have 
probably the most challenging job that I can ever imagine. Having done that type of work as an intern, I quickly realized I didn't have what it takes. So, um, but I do know of situations where FPS therapists have been thought of as CPS uh, workers and have faced some negative types of behaviors accordingly. So be prepared. So anyway, to summarize, FPS therapist really plays an important part in enhancing child safety when we are working with families. We have specific responsibilities, and so let's just review what they are. First of all, we have the responsibility to follow up on safety concerns that are indicated in the FPS referral. The way we do that, we thoroughly explore each safety concern noted by the referring social worker, and we, we note these and we explore these and, and evaluate them in the Family Assessment and Service Plan, and then we continue to address them on an ongoing basis throughout the intervention. Another responsibility to is ensure family compliance with the CA safety plan. We review that safety plan at the first meeting and then again every two week, every two weeks at least. We develop a second safety plan if necessary to clearly provide a list of available supports and action steps for families to take to ensure child safety. And we provide a weekly safety update to the referring social worker. Another responsibility is to provide a thorough family assessment to highlight specific safety concerns subsequently addressed in the service plan. So we complete the NICFAS, we develop a written family assessment, and then with the family, we develop a service plan that focuses on reducing or eliminating any concerns related to child safety. Another responsibility is to as I mentioned, be ever vigilant, observe, listen for, interpret any suggestions or signs that a child has been or could be potentially harmed. Constant vigilance. Um, we keep our eyes open for any indications that the caregivers may not be keeping their children safe. We assess verbal and nonverbal communications, we observe behaviors, all of those good things that we do so well, we're always on the lookout to ensure that nothing stands up and says, wait a minute, we need to look more closely in this. And if it does, we follow up on it. We also have the responsibility to teach families new skills and to connect them to appropriate resources related to decreasing risk of harm and increasing child safety. We do that by introducing families to skills and techniques and resources to further reduce risk factors and to enhance the family's ability to keep children safe and healthy. And when I say introduce, I mean we explain them, we demonstrate them, we practice them with the family. We work to make these new skills, these new techniques and, and um, acquisition of new resources we want to make that part of their ongoing repertoire so that when crises or just, you know, how it is being a parent, just day-to-day -day situations, that they can handle them without having to resort to whatever types of situations led to the referral in the first place. And we comply with mandated reporting in the event of suspected child abuse or neglect. We report any suspicion to the intake worker as mandated. We also provide verbal and written notification to the referring social worker as per the FPS client service contract. So everything we do is focused on ensuring that children remain safe. So in conclusion, from start to finish, each aspect of an FPS intervention is truly geared towards enhancing family and child safety. Regardless of the specific task at hand, the FPS therapist really is always alert to the health, well-being, and children, and safety of the children in every home we visit. Safety of the child is the first priority in FPS 
and the effective therapist is going to focus every intervention toward that end. Thank you so much.